Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to 17 Minutes of Science, the Quarantine Chronicles. Uh, this is our fourth episode, uh, and we're having a great time connecting with you guys this way. Um, uh, my name is Ben Jusela, and I am an R&D scientist at InVivo Biosystems, specializing in zebrafish gene editing. Um, and um, it is my pleasure today to introduce uh, sorry, I have some furry co-hosts here um, <laughs> to introduce uh, Dr. Jen Phillips from the University of Oregon. Um, and she is going to tell us today all about uh, modeling human diseases in zebrafish. And I'm really excited to have you on, Jen. Um, Thank you. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background, um, I have the Timer going. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me on. This is a really uh, great opportunity, and um, I'm really pleased to be with you and whoever else might be watching on Facebook. Um, so I am Jennifer Phillips. I uh, work at the University of Oregon in the uh, laboratory of Monty Westerfield, and we use zebrafish as um, models to study the molecular genetics of human diseases. Um, I got to my current position by way of doing a PhD um, in a different lab at the University of Oregon with Bruce Bowerman and the C. elegans model, and then uh, did a postdoc with Monty, developing a system for, um, for evaluating how zebrafish could be used to study degenerative eye diseases. And everything that we do now in the lab is kind of based on some of the work that I started when I was a when I was a new postdoc there. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of gratifying that it's it's had legs to uh, to last this long. <laughs> it was kind of a long time ago. <laughs> that's that's you know what time is irrelevant. It's a... <laughs> Certainly now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what what drove you to make the switch from from an invertebrate to a vertebrate model or zebrafish in particular? Yeah, you know, I, um, the, funnily enough, the whole reason I came to Oregon for graduate school in the first place was because of zebrafish. Because when I was an undergraduate researcher at Indiana University, and I had just realized for the first time that, like, a career in research was a thing that, that people did, and that I, in fact, could have that career, and I was like, <laughs> And somebody came, I was working, I was doing undergraduate research in a lab with, with sea urchins actually. And somebody oh. came from the Oregon zebrafish group to give a job talk at Indiana University. And that was really the first time that I had heard about zebrafish as a model or anything like that. And I just thought it was enchanting and you know really compelling. So Oregon made my short list of places to interview for grad school. And uh, I chose that even though I didn't end up doing my PhD in that. I had so I was so zebrafish adjacent, you know, like my my fellow graduate students were in zebrafish labs. I went to all the zebrafish talks. I really I really got kind of a um, a, a next door neighbor view of of the power of that system. And I really wanted to study vision. I really wanted to look at eye um, development and, and disorders. So and you know, for all their benefits, worms don't actually have eyes. So. <laughs> So zebrafish was a really a really natural uh, shift for me, and really where I kind of wanted to end up all along um, from from the get go. Yeah, well, that's I mean you've got to suit your suit your model to what you're what you're modeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, having the the organs and the structures that are present in the <laughs> indeed <laughs> are kind of kind of important. Um, so what what about zebrafish in in particular has has um, uh, been the most useful aspect of that model system for studying human disease. What um, what characteristics are 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 you looking at every day in your work? Right. Um, well, you know, it, it depends. They're they're versatile enough that you can do a lot of different approaches to studying things that have an impact on on understanding and um, and making changes to human health. So for our initial purposes, um, I started in the, in the zebrafish lab study, creating uh, models to study a, a genetic disease called Usher syndrome, which is a hereditary deaf blindness. Um, and at first the question was, is zebrafish even a good model to study this? Because it hadn't really uh, been done much at that time, particularly with respect to the vision component of that disorder. Um, 
And that was at a time where the genome wasn't fully sequenced yet. We, we were still um, getting most of the, um, the things to work on from forward genetic screens, looking for interesting characteristics in the fish, and then trying to figure out what was causing those characteristics versus the targeted, you know, interventions that we can do today. Um, but as, as more technological advantages and greater understanding of how to read and manipulate the genome came online, the zebrafish just became, I think, more and more relevant to, um, to be a, a contributor to how we really approach molecular genetic problems in human health and what kind of crosstalk we have between the basic research and the translational research and the clinical um, outcome of that. And it's really a loop. It's not a one-way um, you know, direction for that. We get a lot of feedback from the clinic and adjust our, our um, experiments accordingly. Yeah, so um, so I know that a lot of the work that you do uh, is, is specifically focused on rare disease modeling. And I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit more about exactly what it is you do um, working with the UDN um, as, as one of the hubs on the West Coast here. Sure, sure. Um, right, so, so Usher syndrome is in fact a rare disease um, and it's just it is characterized by numbers, how many people in the world have it. Um, so that's something that, you know, we have a group of people, they all have various sets of symptoms, but lots of different types of genetic changes that cause those symptoms. And that's been a big focus of our work is really communicating with those those individuals, the affected individuals and their families to come up with research that um, can kind of contribute to treatments down the road. Um, with the UDN, the, I feel like the Usher work that we did for years really set us up to, to hit the UDN with all of the things that we had learned because at that point we knew how to make really specific changes in zebrafish genes to give us a good um, kind of mimic of what a human condition was like. And so we were able to really broaden that approach with the UDN project. So, so when we talk about rare disease with the UDN, UDN stands for Undiagnosed Diseases Network. These are individuals who present in the clinic who have something that's so unusual and really defies diagnosis. Um, and they cannot really move forward with even naming the thing that this person has without subsequent work in bioinformatics and in animal models. And that's what we contribute to that. So, so we are really helping the clinicians identify identify what, it's, what is the molecular component of this individual's disorder. How can that knowledge help them going forward with their lives of living with this very unusual and usually fairly severe condition? Um, so it's a, it's a really impressive setup of corresponding with clinicians, with geneticists, with the other model organism communities, with the patient families themselves. And everybody has a really important com contribution to make to, to that effort. Yeah, that's I, I really love the the intersection of communities that is that is involved in the UDN. Um, and I love that the that it is focused on rare diseases because those there's so few resources and it is so hard to to get to get the the, the efforts behind those. Um, For sure. And that was it was actually a genius move to kind of, you know, combine them into things that are so rare we don't even know what to call them and then that in and of itself is a group that in and of itself can can create a community of you know individuals and families to support each other even though they don't necessarily have the same you know thing at, at the genetic level they are all experiencing the same um you know frustration and helplessness of moving through a medical system that doesn't even know how to categorize them so um and you wouldn't think that you know the the just being able to call it something um, would have very much impact, but it's huge to be able to name the thing that you are living with and learning how to understand is a really, really significant contribution. Yeah, I mean, and just a level of validation for somebody who's going through that to, to be able to put a name on it sure, and have sure, sure. recognition of it. Yeah. Um, we've got a question coming in here. Um, what sort of, um, I know that we are all in the midst of um, working from home. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have a very, very nice home office here, but you have a, a lovely, lovely living room set up, it looks like there. Um, how, how are things being impacted by COVID-19 um, 
at the at the facility and um, is there any shift in your research focus right now temporarily right well you know i mean there isn't any any lab research that's that's happening right now we really have to shut everything down um all of our live zebrafish are being very very well taken care for by the um by the animal staff um but it's very restricted access and it's really just kind of on a maintenance plan right now there's no active experimentation happening um either in the fish facility or up on the on the lab bench um, and that is unfortunate and i really miss it and i feel a lot of regret that you know all of the things that we're trying to do for these affected individuals really has to slow way down and that's in corresponding with every other thing that could possibly positively impact their situation like clinical trials or whatever i mean everything is is really out of pause um yeah. I'm, I'm kind of a silver linings girl so i am using the, <laughs> the time to do a lot more writing do a lot more organization of the <clears throat> udn project there are many many different genes that we're working on and it's a long list and it's pretty challenging to keep track of and keep all the notes nicely organized and collated and all of the you know spreadsheets and everything so i i am trying to be grateful for the opportunity that i have to to really pay more attention to that than i usually would if there was some cool experiment waiting for me on the on the lab bench to do so. yeah it's i I've, I've similarly been kind of appreciating that it is a sort of forced slowdown and yeah. <laughs> have to focus on some of those other things that maybe sometimes take a back burner to the day-to-day -day right. mind. Um, let's see, let me check on our time here. We have, okay, we got 610. Um, so um, along with the organizational side of things, what are some of the challenges with working with zebrafish, um, both um, technical and on the husbandry side? What are things that are, that are difficult to do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to model these human diseases? There's, you know, really, there's not a whole lot of difficulty per se. I mean, you always have to be realistic about how close of an approximation can you make between <clears throat> the situation and the human individual and, and what you could produce in the zebrafish. Um, but a, when we choose to begin a UDN case, there's a whole lot of analysis that goes in on the front end of that um, before you know, if we're taking the case, if we're going to um, the effort of, of creating the zebrafish model to study that, it's already been pretty heavily vetted um, that we're going to, you know, more likely than not get something useful and, and productive out of it. So, so we kind of, you know, the system is a little bit biased in that we're not going to, you know, go for the long shots. And honestly, that's, you know, more of a matter of just, you know, staffing <laughs> priorities than anything else but um you know zebrafish can be a little bit um challenging to work with sometimes with these models because um they've got some very tricky ways of compensating for um genetic mutations um that are that are induced by us either or sometimes that occur naturally they've got a lot of ways to to kind of dodge that bullet if you will um and so we have had to kind of get in a little bit of an arms race with them, if you will, and kind of think about, okay, well, we know that they can do this. How can we get around that and get them to um, exhibit these symptoms that, um, that they're blocking because their selves, their selves are clever and they can figure out, you know, how to, how to compensate for, for things that go wrong in one gene by upregulating another for, for, so, so, so that's a bit of a challenge, but, you know, we, we're, we're, we're getting to the point where we can, um, at least attempt to work around it yeah yeah that's the 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 genomic compensation mm -hmm. <laughs> being increasingly unfurled and layers peeled back is uh really cool from yeah. from a like an evolutionary perspective and a sure. developmental plasticity perspective but also when you're trying to precisely model things it is sometimes a little bit of a headache yes indeed you know that and their whole genome duplication is, is right there their fun quirks right. uh, is on the you know so that's on the on the technical side of things on a more like organizational um, regulatory side are there challenges that are faced by the rare disease communities in general that um, that are that are cha that pose challenge for even initiating some of this research as far as funding or um, 
you know, what is, well, what, what does it look like for somebody to, to, to get to the point of being, you know, part of the UDN or one of these other efforts? Sure, sure. Well, and, you know, I mean, that's part of the, of the genius of the UDN has been to kind of give an entry into the system that these patients really lacked before. Um, if you imagine if you have something that's so rare and unnameable, you get bounced around a lot from, you know, one specialist to another and it's expensive and you have to travel a lot and maybe, maybe there's a misdiagnosis that happened as a pretty common thing, um, you know, cause, cause everyone wants to take their best guess and, and call it something. Um, so to be able to have um, a, a really great network of medical centers that communicate with each other and work together and, and not only give a, one individual and their family a place to begin the quest, but also communicate with other places around the country and in Canada also and say, well, hey, you know, we actually have this other family who is going through the same thing. And now you, know, you have two instead of one. And now you, you know, now you can you strengthen the, um, the clinical and the um, basic biological findings and give some more kind of thrust to this um, diagnostic effort that we're all undertaking. Um, it is really challenging to, to not be able to get any solid answers, I think, and, and um, just being able to give a, a, a doorway, you know, give somebody the key to get into the system and start navigating. And it's still not easy. It's still exhausting and frustrating. And at the end of the day, you still have a you know, a, a child or a loved one who is experiencing some pretty serious symptoms, but at least you know that there you have a team. There are people that that care. There are people that are trying to solve it um, because you're important enough for them to make that effort. And that's that's where a lot of the impact for me really really comes in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. We have um, another question coming in here. Uh, from Facebook, and I think we, we definitely have some time for that. We're down to the last minute here. Um, so somebody says, uh, so uh, they say it's perhaps a naive question, but I don't think so. Um, uh, somebody unfamiliar with Usher syndrome, are you making knockout mutants or point mutations? Um, what, what kind of, what kind of um, work are you doing to, to actually model, the, um, model these diseases? Right. Well, it, for Usher syndrome and also for the UDN, we, what we try to do is make the model that is most like um, the, the exact variant that we want to study. You know, human genomes are super messy. There are lots of different changes in all of our genes relative to each other. And sometimes it's not really easy to see if this one is really going to be problematic or if, or if the human body can compensate for that. If you just look at it on paper or model it in the computer, it's often pretty murky. So being able to um, exact that in the zebrafish model can answer a lot of those questions. Um, for Usher syndrome, it's really genetically complex. There are many different genes that contribute to the symptoms of Usher syndrome. So being able to study them one at a time, being able to study how they interact with each other at the protein level, um, these are all things that we do and we really make this specific targeted mutation that will help us answer those specific questions using you know, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing um, almost exclusively at this point. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you for that. It wasn't naive at all. Yeah, no, no, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, one thing to say to make a model, but you know, what that actually looks like is, sure. is not, not always the same or consistent. Sure. Um, so we are, we're at time here. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for, for joining us and talking about the work you're doing. I think it is, um, absolutely critical and very impactful work and it is really cool to see it happening right here in Eugene. Um, yes, go Ducks! <laughs> yes, go Ducks! I'm a convert, but yes. go Ducks! Ben, thank you so much for having me on. I was really, really uh, happy and honored to be able to share my work with everybody today. Yes, well, thank you so much and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, this has been 17 Minutes in Science and uh, we will see you, I think, next week, same time. So right. thanks everyone. <laughs>